You guys ready to study the Word of God this morning? Awesome. Um, I, a number of years ago, how many remember, how many years ago was that when it never stopped snowing? Remember here in, New, in, in Connecticut, it didn't stop snowing. I mean, I never saw the ground for like two and a half months. It, it snowed so much, I had to go on the roof of my house. <laughs> my wife was very upset with me. You could fall and die. I said, well, honey, I don't want the, the, the roof collapsing on me. So we were up there. We were shoving the roof. Remember that? It was nonstop snow. And, uh, and so let us know, let us know, let us know. That, that, that song became true. Anyhow, so one of our folks in our church, one of our leaders in our church, had a wood-burning stove in their house, and they went to bed that night. But apparently there was a, some sort of leak in the chimney or something, and the, the fire got under it, and it, it began to burn the house down while they were sleeping. And so they got up in the middle of the night, and they had to grab their, their family and their dogs and get out of the house, right? Because why? Because the house was burning. Their life could end at any moment. This past summer in, in Maui in, in Hawaii, there was tremendous fires. People had to run out of their homes. They had to get out of their homes or they'd lose their life. When you're running out of the home, you're not thinking about your clothing. You're not thinking about your job. You're not thinking about how many likes you have on social media. You're not thinking about how you compare to somebody else. You're thinking of two things. Can I live, right? I need to live, I, my loved ones in God. Three things. Everything else is pale in the comparison. In fact, I, I just past week, there's several, uh, three or four weeks now, it's been a difficult set of circumstances. We've had a number of people in my own family and also people in our church that have been suffering some health setbacks where I've actually spoke to someone that doesn't know how much longer they have to live. They're at the verge right now. Unless God shows up, they don't know they're going to make it. And they were telling me, Pastor, I'm going to tell you right now, nothing else matters to me but God and my wife. I don't care about my hobbies. I don't care about all these other things I was so concerned about. It means nothing because all that matters is, is God and my wife at this point. And so you don't need to understand. You need to understand, everybody, that at the end of your life, I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. You can't take it with you except what you do for God in worship. You can take with you. And so today we want to talk a little bit more about that. And Jesus is dealing with somebody. Here in the Bible, Jesus is dealing with somebody who I think is the quintessential American dream candidate. If you're going to make somebody in Christ's time that could emulate what you and I long to do, it's this guy. And when you read the story, you're going to find, well, what's the problem with the story? You'll see in a few moments. But let's go ahead as Jesus gives a parable to illustrate a spiritual truth that we must hold on to. Here he goes in Luke 12, 16. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a, remember we said last week, but we're all rich. If you make $64,000 a year, you're the top 1%. If you make uh, $43,000 a year, you're top 4%. Incidentally, I heard from, I, just gotta, I gotta mention this. This is the third service. I read that, you guess how much we mentioned, last week we mentioned how much money people needed to be secure in. Average American is $243,000. You know what the millennials want? <laughs> $518,000 a year. Okay, I thought that was funny. All right, then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm. In other words, he had a lot of money. We don't have farms today like we do back in those days. That was an indication of wealth. In other words, he had a lot of property. He had a lot of assets. He had things in the bank. He had stock that wasn't falling, okay? The rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. He's like, I got so much stuff, I don't know what to do with it. And does anyone else here have that problem? How many of you have storage sheds? Okay, this is what this guy's going through. Like, like ourselves as well. We don't have parking, we don't have space. We got to do something about it, he's saying to himself. Not a bad thing. Then he said, I know I'll tear down my barns and big, bigger ones. We're going to tear down some buildings here and build bigger ones. I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. Don't you wish you had a place to put your wheat? Some of you have wheat thins. Okay. And I'll sit back and say to myself, what a wonderful life. Okay, I, 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 like, uh, I like that guy, whoever sings that. I, tell me the last story. Help me out again, guys. Which, who was that? Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, okay. Not Neil Armstrong. 
but Louis Armstrong. Strong. And so, uh, you know, what a wonderful life. I'm going to sit back and say to myself, right? Do you not want to sit back and say to yourself, what a wonderful life? Wouldn't you like to sit back and say to yourself, I don't have a worry in the world. I have enough money to live for the rest of my life. I can go out to eat every night, every day at Ruth's, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse if I want to. Everything is beautiful. I'm doing great. This is what this guy was saying. Everything he wanted. I'll say to myself, what a wonderful life, right? I have enough. I have enough stored away for years to come. Now, take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Is this not the American dream? Come on. If I'm an investment banker or financial planner, this is where you want you to be. Is that a bad thing? No, I want to be independently wealthy. I want to be happy at the end of my life. I can travel around and visit the grandkids and go visit other parts of the world. I want to just eat at fine restaurants and go to England and go to Italy and go to Sicily and go to all the incredible places in the world. I want to go to the Par I want to go to Paris, right? All these great stuff. But God said to him, "You fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for?" Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. You see when it's all about stuff you have, we talked about that we've been trained as a culture to want more. We've been told that you must have more to be happy. We're a materialistic culture. The advertising agencies, how they survive is to get you to want things you don't need. They tell you that the house you're living is not big enough. The TV you have is not bright enough or big enough. The car you're driving is too old, right? You need to do something about this person. You need to expand. You need, and listen, there's nothing wrong with getting better. But there comes a point where the value of life is based upon how many likes you have, how many follows you have, how much money you have in the bank, what you look like, right? All these things. And we are conditioned as a culture. If you're not aware of the fact this is happening, you're under a delusion. You are and I are all being, just pay attention now and watch what the advertising agencies do. They make you feel like it's not good enough until you have this. And so we're living for this right? But Jesus is saying there's more than that. What happens if you were to die? Then what? It all means nothing. When your health is poor and you have nothing else to go with, it's not very good. This is what Jesus says. Do not lay up for yourself. Treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but what? Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Where you put your treasure, that's where your heart is. Perhaps the best spiritual journal of your health is looking at your bank account, looking at what goes out. Where am I spending most of the money that I have been entrusted with will show you what really matters to your life. It's a good indication. So don't, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We want to invest in something called eternity, eternal, eternal reward on investment, eternal reward on investment. I want eternal rewards. I want to invest in what matters the most, right? In the, in the financial realm, that's what you want to do. You want a good return on your investment. But how would you feel to get to heaven and have nothing to show for it? You know, the Apostle Paul speaks very clearly to us today and the church back in Corinth to this. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which has been, excuse me, anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, what's the foundation? Jesus. And what's it called? Cornerstone. That's why we call ourselves Cornerstone. We build our lives upon the firm foundation. Anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Now, what is he talking about? Well, let's look and see what he says. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. God will reward us one day for how we live our lives. 
He has rewards. I don't know about you, but I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy today. I, I want to have rewards, right? Anyone's work he has built on endures. He will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through the fire. What does that mean? That means this. If you're living your life for yourself, it's all going to burn away. If I pastor this church, which is easy to do, for my own ego and for my own self-assurance, I need to be needed. I need to be wanted, right? I need to be important. And let's suppose that 80% of the value of me being here is for me, even though I'm doing a good thing. Even though people are giving their lives to Christ, families are growing strong. We're building buildings. We're sending missionaries around the world. We're giving millions of dollars away to missions. That's all great and wonderful. But if I'm doing it because of my ego, because I need to be liked, I want to be liked by you. And by the way, I have to fight against that. Because my, 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 my worth is not based upon you. My worth is based upon Jesus Christ. You see? And so I constantly have to shut it off for me and say, Lord, this is for you. I want to make sure I'm 100% involved doing this for Jesus Christ, that one day when I get to the other side, he'll say, you pastored the church with the right motivations. You, you took care of your wife with the right motiva motivations. You took care of your children with the right motivations. I want the right motivations because God will judge my heart. And the heart is deceitful above all. And so I know when I'm out in, in trouble, when I get frustrated, when I, when I get anxious, uh-oh, 3 o'clock in the morning, you wake up. I don't know why 3 o'clock. Why is it 3 o'clock in the morning? I wake up. I start thinking of a couple things in the church. I'm like, oh, boy. And I go, wait a minute, Lord. Hey, oh, this is your church, Lord. You take care of it. I'm going back to sleep. Right? This is the Lord's church, not mine. Right? And so when I understand that, it becomes his problem. And now it's his power that gives me the power to do what I need to do. And so that's what we do. We want to do everything we do for the Lord. The moment you feel like, that's not fair. I'm not being recognized. Ah, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. My ministry, I should be on the platform preaching, not that person who just got up there. Ah, you got an issue. You got issues that require tissues. You need to repent and get right with God. It's not about us. And the truth is, the more you want, the less you get. But when you live a life of giving, I don't care about me. I care about giving more to Christ. See, God is not blessed giving. Remember that. Amen. Okay, guys, thank you so much. God is not blessed giving. He blesses giving with the what? Right heart. So that's what we're talking about here today. We get to give, not give to get. Remember we talked about last week, give me a $1,000 and God will give you, right? That's not what we preach. That, that is wrong. That is an abusive system. That is totally based upon the flesh. We give to get. No, we give, we get to give. And that is the secret of our lives. You see, Jesus says this, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? Let's say you become the richest man on the world, the richest woman on the world, worth a trillion dollars. And what do you benefit if you, if you gain the whole world, but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. Let me ask you guys a question. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I'm telling you right now, you may come to church for the last 15 years. It doesn't make a difference, really. It's not about church. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? And one day, you're going to have to stand before God, and God say, why should I let you be in for eternity? And you say, well, I'm a pretty good person. That doesn't cut it. There's only one reason that you and I have any right to go to, through Christ. It's this. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross and paid for your sins and my sins, and he rose again from the dead. And you have to be willing to step down from being in charge. Say, God, it's not my life. It's your life. That, my friend, is the key. And the good news is no one's good enough. And the good news is he's good enough. And so I want to lead you in a prayer right now. Maybe you're not walking with God right now. Maybe you used to walk with God and you're not. This is important. We've had people come here and die the same week. And I want to make sure I don't have blood on my hands that I tell you that there's a day coming. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And one day you have to stand before him. There's only one way. It's through Christ. And so I'm going to ask you a quick question with every head bowed and every eye closed. How many of you would say right now, Pastor, I'm not quite sure I am with God, but I want to get right. Or I used to walk with God and I'm not walking anymore. Today I want to get right. Nice and high. I saw one already. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. 
Let's pray this prayer together in our hearts. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. Today, I make a choice to surrender my life to you. I declare you are God and I am not. Come into my life today and empower me to live the life I've been called to live. Thank you that I am now your child in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you've been what Jesus called born again. We want to help you. We're not people that say a prayer and goodbye. We are people that follow Christ together. If you want to fill one of these cards out in the front pocket or online as well, you can do it. And at the end of the service, we'll have a prayer team up here or go to the front desk. We'll give you a Bible and we'll help you on your next steps, okay? Hey, everybody, I also want to let you know what's been going on. We're in the process of we want to reach more people for Jesus Christ. And so in a few moments, I'm going to show you a, a quick video that kind of explains the process that we've been in and how God gave us a vision, how we stepped out in faith, and how we made a difference. Let's go ahead and show that video, please. The best way to begin anything is to start with the end in mind. As C.T. Stud penned, only one life too soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. At Cornerstone, we want to invest in eternity by loving God, surrendering to His freedom, and growing together. We exist to see lost people saved, saved people pastored, pastored people trained, and trained people mobilized. Over 10 years ago, our church family began to grow. I believe I heard God say, it's time to prepare for growth and expand Cornerstone's building. Go from the sanctuary, and all the kids go in line. I wait a long time, sometimes, sometimes I run to the children's church. Well, when it's like a sunny day, like every Sunday, you just like go like a zigzag to the sidewalk over there. But when it's rainy days, there's going to be some puddles there. Lord, how are we going to do it? This is what I heard him say. Build people to build a building, to build more people. With God's grace and our Cornerstone family working together in faith, that dream became a reality. And here we are today, we're living it. I am grateful to see our church come together and invest in my life. We had the faith to see, believe, and here we are today again, to believe to reach more kids like I was, as well as everyone. Our world is changing, and now more than ever, we need to reach people at all stages of life especially to make room for the next generations. Our current sanctuary cannot be fully utilized due to a lack of parking. We have plans to add 84 parking spaces, allowing us to use the full capacity of our sanctuary. Our children's classes are beyond capacity, including the nursery. We believe in creating dedicated spaces for our children and youth to grow. We are positioning ourselves to become a resource center for individuals and families to grow reaching out to our surrounding communities, making room for evolving needs. Our Cornerstone family is now the largest we've ever been in our 40 year history. The children's ministry has grown by over 40% and our Sunday morning attendance has increased over 20%. I wanna encourage you to ask God what he wants you to do and step out in faith. Once again, let's build up. So I wanna encourage you to pray. I wanna encourage you to pray for this project and we're gonna believe God to do great things as we continue to grow together to make a difference for eternity. God bless you guys. All right, that's exciting. Yeah. So, uh, can you hear me okay? Awesome. So, this is what's going on. And since June, we've been a meeting with a Jeffrey Parker Architects. I met him over 10 years ago. My friend David Ferranti, one of my best friends. Uh, said, you can need to meet this guy. He, he gets church, and we partnershiped, and we checked what he did, did great work. He came out here, he worked together over 10 years ago uh, with a vision, a napkin, you name it, and we were able to see, you're sitting in a, a vision that became reality. You're sitting in faith. Right below you, there are scripture verses. On this stage, scripture verses, a Bible are buried in the front. This whole place has scripture all over it. 
And this is the reason we're here today. Steve Albert said that God is going to use this building to reach more and more people, and he was exactly correct. And so God's doing great things. And so in June, we began to look again. We began to plan because we're running out of space. We, we, don't just, we see the trajectory we're on. We have to make space to grow. And so as a result, we put a building committee together, started meeting in June. And in October, we had an input form where we share with the, we, the dream teamers are those that serve at Cornerstone Church. Okay, and so we had a breakfast, explain a little bit about that. We had an input form on Sunday where you guys gave us ideas and what things we could do to improve. And so today we want to show you what your work and our work all put together. Would you please welcome back to Cornerstone Church, my friend who just got out of prison because he's got the striped shirt, Jeffrey Parker. Come on up. <laughs> Go get him. All right. Yeah, I think the where's Waldo analogy is a little better one. Anyway, it is so exciting to be back here and see God moving in your church in so many wonderful ways. When I first met your church uh, about 13 years ago, you were in just that original building over there, and you were jam-packed in there uh, trying to make things work, doing a lot of workarounds like sending the kids off in the white building that you have, the White House, uh, because there was no room in the inn, in the in the main building for that, there weren't enough parking spaces. And so you did this. And now we're back at that same situation again, again where God just continues to bless your ministry with life's changing. You probably can't imagine being able to minister without this facility, uh, because many of you wouldn't have been able to fit in here. But there's a lot of other people out there that we need to make space for uh, so that we can continue, your ministry can continue to change lives with adults, kids, uh, and so forth. And so, again, there's a parking problem. We can't fill up the building like what you could because there's not enough parking spaces to go around. And then the kids are getting sandwiched into an area that's really too small. And, um, you know, I think God looks at what we're doing and we're thinking, you know what, we can do better. We can do better than that. So that's what we've been doing as a committee is looking, okay, what, what can you do? What can we do next to make space for more adults, more kids, and continue to minister with excellence and change lives. So if we could have the first slide, I'm going to just walk you through the addition that we've come up with as a collaboration with your building committee, with all of you that participated back in October, and with God's uh, direction. So we're sitting uh, in the upper left in the worship space, uh, and we're facing up, and then to the bottom right is the church commons. The area with the gold line looping around it is your original building, which we are renovating or repurposing for uh, the Dream Team special needs in 6th through 7th grade. And to the right of that is a new uh, building addition, and that building addition is for kids, uh, newborns through fifth grade, uh, although it's also intended for youth. So it has double duty that way. So if we take, if we start at the top, I'll walk you through. Uh, at the top of the building addition in the purple and blue colors, uh, that is early childhood or newborns through kindergarten. There are several rooms that are clustered around that drop-off area where um, it makes it easy for drop-offs. It's wide enough where there's not a lot of congestion and chaos. It's easy to have chaos when you have a lot of kids and you're going through all of that. Uh, and we've done it in a way we're emphasizing safety and security. So there's the drop-off area, the rooms around it, and then at the very top, there's a room for nursing moms. Uh, and so that's that area, and on the bottom of that, in the teal color, is a room that has two purposes, really more than that even, but principally for first through fifth grade, and also for youth. 
Uh, it's a large room, though, that has all kinds of multi-use capabilities, so there's storage rooms surrounding that where you can put things away and take things out and use it for a variety uh, of things, of purposes. But what we're showing here is a worship area that's facing to the left, and then to the right side of that is a game area and a lounge area. Uh, just to show how it can lay out. There's a lot of uh, activity areas uh, within that space. There's also a boys and girls bathroom that you get to from inside that room. So once kids are in there, they have no reason to leave that space and they can remain in a real safe and secure environment until their parents come and pick them up. The same is true at the top side in the early childhood area where they have their own bathrooms there are two toilet rooms so again once kids are checked in there's no reason for them to have to leave in between those two areas is what we're calling a family lobby in that family lobby hooks over to the right where it says entrance that's facing the where the parking lot is being expanded which we'll show you shortly so there's a new parking area for the, over there you could come in through that entrance into the family lobby uh, parents that have little kids might prefer to come in that way because it'll be a lot easier than coming in the entrance you have now and threading your way through the church commons however it's just uh, it's just as accessible if you were to come that way. So you come in through that entrance into the family lobby. You continue to the left into the renovation area, and then you'd hook up through the same doors that are there now and go into the church commons. Now we'll give a, a short, I have to catch my breath, I get excited and uh, have to hit a quick pause here. Uh, but in the renovation area, what we have are some special areas that we got particular input from at that um, at those October meetings we had with uh, at the input forum and the congregational uh, meeting. So um, for that, what we did is we have a special needs room now that's specific for special needs. It's not a shared use space. They have a lot of big things in there. Uh, and before we had that room shared with adult, as an adult meeting room, and so they'd have to set up, tear down, set up, tear down all the time, and that gets old, and so now there's a space that can be custom set up for special needs, that's their space. Down from that is a sixth through seventh grade room, which uh, allows you the opportunity to start a ministry specific to those ages uh, when that time is right and also to use that room as a large uh, adult meeting room. The gold room that's a little bit up from there is a space for the dream team. Right now they have that set up in the office area. This would create a special room for them where they have uh, uh, donuts and muffins and coffee and things like that, but to treat uh, people that are volunteering here and having multiple services and so forth, a place for them to just take a break from the busyness between services, have lockers to put purses and coats away, things like that. So that's, that's what that room is. And then not but least, we heard uh, at the... Um, at the input form that we had that the kitchen is a bit tight on space and people that use it uh, are not particularly enamored with it the way it is. So could we make it better? And so what we did is expanded the kitchen into the um, top portion of that renovation area so that the um, kitchen would now be bigger, and it would also have a door that goes into that beige uh, hallway, that new hallway, so that you can get into the kitchen now without having to go through your church commons. You could just, you could come in the back, and if there's uh, an activity or you're using that commons for another purpose, that to get to the kitchen, you're not interrupting going back and forth 
say with catering food in or needing to take trash out, anything like that, people that are working there. So there's a secret way uh, to get into that kitchen, uh, in and out of that kitchen now. The WD in the bottom left corner of that room is a washer dryer, and that's uh, so that you can uh, take care of uh, cloth napkins, tablecloths, things like that without having uh, to take them home. I was talking to somebody in between services, and they said, geez, that reminds me, I just washed uh, tab uh, uh, tablecloths, and I forgot to bring them back to church. So this way, you won't have to be uh, carting things back and forth. You could do it uh, right here. Okay, so what I haven't mentioned yet is there's a big storage component on the right that's a basement. Uh, the property that you have is, uh, I like to say, topographically challenged, but it has a lot of sloping to it, which gives it a lot of uh, character, makes it beautiful, but it's, it's tough to use for parking lots and buildings. And so where the addition is, we're trying to maximize the amount of property that we can use for building and parking. And so it makes sense to think of the addition as being like a walkout of a house where it's building towards the edge of the drop-off area. So as you build out, you have space underneath uh, that we could easily use for uh, a basement, and it could have windows and access. So that uh, that's what's on the right. It's a large storage room or basement that's beneath the pre uh, the early childhood area. It'd be accessed by an elevator and stairs, so it's easy to get things up and down, whether it's carts of tables or chairs or Christmas decorations or whatever that you use sporadically, they're easy to get to and there's a place for that. The idea is that when we put the parking lot in, we will have to uh, remove Sal's house, which right now has, you might think that, that large adult meeting room at the bottom left, that's kind of taking the Sal's house room and moving it over here, but making it bigger and at the White House that you have, there's a special needs space in there. It's moving that from there into here, making it bigger and more customized rather than being a bit makeshift. And then there's a lot of storage that is squirreled away in those different buildings. Um, and so it creates a space for that in that basement level. Next, please. This is the site plan that shows how the parking would be wrapped around the building uh, following the road and then up around the right, really doing something similar to what you already have, but going in the opposite direction, adding, and it shows the, uh, the building addition in red, renovation in gold, and the existing building uh, in gray. So this adds 84 parking spaces to what you already have so that um, now there'll be a place for people to park again. And there's a new entrance drive at the bottom right. That's actually the driveway that goes to your garage that's at that end of your property right now. And uh, I think that's it for this slide. So the next, this is what it would look like. Uh, it's, it picks up on the theme of what you have in this edition so that there's uh, continuity with the look of the building um, as you go around it. So I think that's, prop awesome. that's the new entrance, too, by the way, where you would go in and into that new uh, family lobby. Awesome. Isn't that great, guys? You like it? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, so as you can see, you know, when we're thinking about the future and what's so nice about this is I'm not a big fan of basements, but this is nice because you can actually, we can put a classroom there or whatever. It's a large place. Go back to the two slides back if you can real quick. Yeah, that's a pretty large, that's 20, that's 2,100 square foot or is that 3,000 square foot altogether, Jeff? Uh, 39. Oh, 39. 39. Yeah, that's pretty big, you know? 
So we could do a lot with that space, but we're looking at future classroom. We need uh, storage. And so that's why we're doing that. Also, we built these um, classrooms in mind that they could be flexible. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, our culture, unfortunately, what's going on at public education uh, in some ways is some of it's getting pretty, um, I would venture to say, abusive, where they're telling children crazy things that are not true about themselves. And so we have to protect our children, and we also have to provide an opportunity. And so we're looking to see, could we do a preschool? Could we do a daycare? Could we have a co-op to help uh, homeschoolers and utilize our entire building for that during the week? Uh, we would think about, even we're, we're thinking about giving parenting classes and helping parents with their children and how to deal with all the issues that kids have to face that you and I never had to face at their age. So we want this to be a resource center during the week as well, not just Sundays. So we're thinking ahead. We're not just thinking of now. And I'm also praying, I am keep on blessing that guy next to us. He has that three-family home. We're praying, and a big thing down there. Like, whenever you want to sell it, let us know, because we can even do more with that. So we want to make this a place that's going to be able to help families, help individuals to grow together. Now, if you like what you see, can you let me know? You like it? All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so next week is Legacy Sunday. What we're, our goal for this is to double our income for, for uh, December. So whatever we normally bring, we want to bring in double. And what we're going to do is we're going to give to ministries such as Project Rescue, which rescues girls off the streets and helps them raise their kids and out of the sex trafficking situation. We're also helping out with Go Haiti. We also want to be able to put some significant seed money to this project. So that's next week. So we want to encourage you to go home and pray, God, what should we give as an end of the year offering and blessing? Some of us get bonuses and various things like that. Just think about it. Pray about it. Remember, God loves a cheerful giver. We're not twisting anyone's arm. You, this is what we ask you to do. Ask the Lord what you should do. And then walk out in faith and watch what God will do. Because God will provide our needs, not our greeds. And I think this is a worthwhile uh, thing to get involved with. Amen?